House Financial Services Committee is taking steps to shift the cost of bank rescues from taxpayers to other financial institutions with more than $10 billion in assets. Secretary Timothy Geithner is scheduled to testify to the committee tomorrow morning and is expected to endorse the plan. Scott Talbot is the Senior Vice President for Government Affairs at the Financial Services Roundtable. Many of the financial firms, the banks, are members of his organization. He supports some aspects of the bill but has concerns over certain areas. He joins us now from our Washington newsroom. So, Scott, let's talk about what areas, first of all, of this bill that you support. Sure. We support, the, first of all, the fact that if a company is going to fail, let's go ahead and let them fail. And we agree that the cost shouldn't necessarily be borne by the taxpayer. So we're, we're in agreement on principle there. We're looking to modernize our regulatory system to help minimize impact of non, the failures of non-depository institutions. What we support in the bill, and it's a big step forward from previous proposals, is the fact that there's no public list of these companies, which we think could create a moral hazard. Two, there's better coordination between all the regulators, which is breaks down the silos that helped allow things like subprime mortgages to escape unnoticed since no one was sort of checking on it. Um, and um, we're also in favor of preserving the thrift charter as well as the ILC charter going forward. We think those are important pieces to the, the American economy. Does it concern you that any bank with uh, assets of below $10 billion would have to kind of work to keep those assets limited? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it could create this artificial glass ceiling, if you will, for smaller institutions to prevent themselves from getting larger. It actually has a perverse impact to, on, you know, act as a disincentive to grow because you'd get, in effect, penalized if you went over $10 billion in assets. You know, one of your other concerns is that, you know, I'm looking at my notes here, that your, our guys, meaning your members, people like J.P. Morgan, Citigroup, will have to pay for this. Well, what's so wrong with that considering taxpayers have had to pay for it in the last few months? Well, what's wrong is we're not against industry necessarily paying for it, but when you add the cost of this regulation, the potential cost of them having to shoulder any losses, as well as any potential cost from the CFPA, that could be hundreds of millions of dollars hitting any one institution of this size. We think that's not, a, those not are large hits. Those are, not if everybody doesn't take on undue risk. Well, that, we'll focus on that in a minute, but the, the fact the fact the matter is that these costs could hit these institutions, and there's, they could be significant. Now, as far as the plan is concerned, it is after-the-fact funding. It's not pre-funding like the DIFF fund, mm -hmm. so we're in favor of after-the-fact funding. But these dollars could add up pretty quickly when you combine the total increased costs of all the regulatory reforms that are out there, not just this plan, this proposal. I wonder what you think about, there's a lot of things in this uh, bill that are pretty subjective, and Josh Rosner from Graham Fisher writes in a, a whole list of uh, complaints about what he calls the worst piece of legislation he's ever read. Uh, one of them is that the Fed can choose to change the definition of credit exposure if it determines it's in the public interest. It's incredibly subjective. Another one, for the purposes of this bill, a financial services company can be any company. I mean, are you concerned about how wishy-washy it seems to be? Well, yes, to some extent we are, and I wonder if the, 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 the caller has uh, read the CFPA bill. But, yeah, we are concerned about sort of the breadth and the wishy-washiness. But at the same time, you have to recognize there is no one-size-fits-all. Every institution is unique. And so we're in favor of giving sort of broad powers to give the Fed or the council the ability to look at each type of company to look for systemic risk. Remember, we're trying to prevent risks from bringing down the system or bringing down the companies. And so that, that's tough to quantify. If you list it out every risk, there would certainly be a, no, a new one tomorrow that wouldn't be on the list. So we don't want to miss anything. And so we're in favor of the broad powers. At the same time, we think that, it, that the proposal focuses too much on size and too much on capital. Just being large is not an addition of a weakness or, or a risk to safety and soundness. We, we think that the well, Fed but, and the but board... Well, wait a minute, Scott. I mean, isn't the whole yeah. idea of all of this financial regulatory reform getting at the crux of the matter of having these two big firms, too big to fail, I mean, a la AIG and so on? I mean, that's essentially what causes massive ba bailout and got us into this, no. this situation. So, yeah, not maybe we should be getting at these firms that are too big to fail. Yeah, no, not necessarily size. Just because you're big does not necessarily mean you're a threat to safety and soundness. We think that the focus should be on the riskiness of the activities that but, the entity engages but in. Maybe we need to focus on everything because we had a lot of regulations in place and so on, and nothing seemed to work, and we got into this mess. So maybe we need to kind of hit it at all, all ends, if you will. Right. We could agree. The proposal focuses too much on size and not enough on every other factor, like the riskiness of the activities. And additionally, it also says any to cure most of the ills, they want to increase capital. Well, okay. that doesn't necessarily work for non-banks. But well, you think the CFPA is worse. Scott Talbot, thanks so much for joining us. We're